Good evening. Sorry, Esther, to disturb you. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. It's been on the ground tonight, but we always say it's quality, not quantity. Isn't that right? Yes. Yes, exactly. Great pleasure to introduce to our awareness night tonight, David Powell, who is a certificate holder with the SMU. Uh, I have a great rapport. It probably hates me for that long. <laughs> <laughs> A great rapport with David for his understanding and his presentation, so we could think of nobody better to engage us all with this discussion. Don't forget, you know, yes, by all means, listen to what's being said, but yes, ask questions. You know, for so long now, we've just had this uh, thing within our churches and centres, come in, sit down, listen, go home. And actually, we want to know the nuts and bolts. We want to understand the mechanics of all the different aspects of spiritualism. So tonight's topic is the evidential message. And are you all happy with what, when I say an evidential message? This is what we've become accustomed to saying the role of a medium. When we say the word medium, we automatically assume somebody up here is saying, I've got your mother here. A medium is that interface between the two worlds. So that mediumship can manifest in art, in creativity, in organisation, in healing, in, <laughs> yeah, in whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 92 years, we still haven't found it, but we, we don't give up hope. <laughs> so, yeah, we're looking at the role of the evidential medium. And actually the role of the message, what is that and part of our religion and philosophy and way of life of spiritualism? So after that humongous introduction, David, Thank sir, you. hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, it is an absolute pleasure and a joy to be with you um, here this evening. And this is a bit of a novelty for me because I'm stood on a platform and I'm not wearing a suit, shirt and a tie. So um, <laughs> I actually quite, quite get used to being uh, kind of dressed like this. Whether a Sunday congregation would is another matter. Um, the subject area that um, Lawrence put to me is, uh, as he's just said, uh, is to look at the uh, part that evidential communication uh, takes place within um, spiritualism. Um, that said, I'm fully anticipating that we will go off piste. We will go off in all sorts of directions and tangents because I know with absolute certainty that you come here this evening for one reason and that's not because there's nothing on television or anything like that it's warm yeah it's <laughs> nice and warm <laughs> but that one reason being is that you have a question or you have questions because if you knew all the answers you wouldn't be here if you knew what you wanted and needed to know you wouldn't have come tonight so on the basis that you have questions, I'm of course um, fully anticipating that during the course of the evening, you'll feel free to put those questions forward. And I know you'll be comfortable with that because I know the kind of people that you are. But just in case you're not comfortable, let me say, if there's not any questions, then we're going to turn the tables. Because I've been studying mediumship now for oh, 23, 24 years, and I've got more questions now than what I had when I started 20 odd years ago. So, um, as Lawrence said, this is not going to be about me talking at you um, for the next hour or so. Um, I'd hope that we can have um, a discussion, 
by all means I will kind of lead it off in a direction but I'd be very happy that as we're going through um, the material if there's anything that is either not clear or you want to offer an alternative view or to question something then far away okay and um, I think that way we'll have a really um, productive um, evening the other thing I would say, of course, is I'm not the font of all knowledge, but we've got Lawrence here with me, so uh, <laughs> between the two of us and um, our dear friends uh, upstairs, as it were, then um, there should be you know, answers to most questions. The only things that we can't cover are predictions of tall, dark, handsome strangers and the winning numbers for next week's lottery. Okay, okay so sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> on that score oh well thanks for coming over yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll just go now okay <laughs> all right um so evidential communication before we get into the nuts and bolts of that what i'd like to do is just kind of uh, set a scene and to give a context to what we understand as evidential communication we know, of course, that there's been communication between uh, this world and what we call the spirit world throughout the history of humanity. For as long as there have been humans, there has been communication between the two um, realms. And if you look in any religious teaching, uh, to my knowledge, there is one which does not um, advance the view, does not promote the idea that there is something beyond this life, that there is a continuation, there is a, a new phase of living. But spiritualism is, um, I believe and I understand, uniquely different in that all other religions ask you to take it on faith, that when we die, there is a resurrection or there is a new phase of living. Spiritualism, though, says that, but then also demonstrates it. And for as long as there has been spiritualism, in whatever form uh, we may choose to uh, describe or label it, there has been communication. Modern spiritualism, as we may or may not know, uh, is regarded as starting in the mid-1800s, 1848 be precise, in um, Hydesville, in New York State, in America. And uh, whether people are familiar, I'll just give you a kind of a refresh. There were um, some sisters, young sisters, called the Fox Sisters. Um, and they discovered um, they had rappings, knocking noises coming from inside their house. And they were naturally curious about this. And with a bit of practice, um, they were able to establish um, a code, you know, like one knock for yes, two for no. And they held um, an intelligent communication with this unseen um, spirit. And what they subsequently discovered was that the identity of this unseen communicator had been um, a peddler, a travelling salesman, and he gave information um, that he'd been murdered by the previous occupant of the house and his remains were buried in the cellar. Now you can imagine these were relatively young sisters so what did they go and do they got their shovels out and went and dug up the cellar <laughs> and what did they find they come across the remains and trinkets and bits and pieces and that was the um if you like the launch point what's regarded as the beginning of modern spiritualism and i say that was 31st of march um, 1848 in hydesville usa the very first spiritualist church in the UK um, opened 1852 in Yorkshire. So not that many years thereafter. And since uh, 1852, pretty much every week um, since then and throughout all the uh, 
periods of wartime and what have you, there have been demonstrations of mediumship, both public demonstrations and, of course, um, communications taking place in, in private homes and one-to-one -one sittings. So we've had this uh, relatively uh, recent, in the scheme of things, um, continuous period of time where there has been communication from the so-called dead to the living. And what I will say at this point is that communication with the dead is impossible. Do I need to say that again? Communication with the dead is impossible. Are you all a bit confused now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, I've been practicing mediumship um, publicly for the last 13 years, and I have yet to communicate with a dead person. I communicate with lots of living people, but none of them are dead. They're very much alive. They are simply in another dimension, continuing to live in a different form. They're not dead. Their bodies um, that they had, by all means, may be dead, but they're not dead. So, we have had this huge history of um, communication between the two worlds. You might ask yourself, why is it then, with that history of communication that's taken place, why is it that we as spiritualists, as this small group of people here this evening, are the minority view? Why isn't it accepted throughout all of humanity that death is simply a doorway, is a transition point, and life is eternal? Let's just pause at that point. Does anybody have a view on that? Why is it that we remain a small minority who have this belief, who have this knowledge, who have this understanding? Well, other religions <coughs> deny it. And they're in the majority. I mean, I've said before that with spiritualism, it's the only religion that never says don't. Very true. Yeah. You, you could go to a Catholic church. Yeah. You will. You will. You must do this. Do that. Yeah. You have to do as you like. Yeah. You could say, you could say there is perhaps still very strong vested interests in maintaining the status quo. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, all, all sorts of reasons why the status quo uh, may be the preferred outcome. Um, it's also worth noting that within the history of mediumship, Emma Hardinge Britton, who was one of the great pioneers of uh, modern spiritualism, she gave a prediction, and that prediction was that if spiritualism didn't change humanity within the first hundred years, it wouldn't. Now clearly we've gone beyond that um, hundred years and it, it, it certainly has made uh, changes and significant changes. But the understanding that we have and we share is not a universal view. So um, although I have great faith and belief in um, the words and the conviction of Emma Hardinge Britton, um, it falls to us as the new pioneers to be part of that movement to demonstrate that reality that life is indeed um, continuous. But perhaps one of the reasons, going back to that question about why is it that um, communication with the so-called dead is seen as something on a par with you know fairies and goblins and all that kind of stuff, is that we could say that there are predominantly two modes of perception. There are two ways of um, regarding life. On one hand you have the traditional materialistic mindset, if you like, and um, I prepared a little handout which I'll pass around and you're welcome to kind of take. And for the benefit of those people who are kind of reading on, uh, watching online, I'll just take one and pass one around, please. We'll just kind of highlight these um, these two, 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 two um, 
uh, perspectives. So I've called one the traditional materialistic, and I'd suggest to you that most of the population throughout planet Earth kind of fall within this first uh, mindset, and this is what I call traditional materialistic. So the first point, at this point David will get his glasses on. <laughs> Okay, so these are the consequences and implications of um, the traditional materialistic model mindset. Consciousness arises from matter, i.e. the brain. If the brain is dead, there can be no consciousness. You and I and everyone else on planet Earth are separate beings. We are separate from other living organisms and therefore separate from nature. My thoughts are my own and rise and only exist within the confines of my mind. Communication between the living and dead is impossible as the dead do not have brains and therefore do not have consciousness. Events such as near-death experiences, past life memories, deja vu, ESP, synchronistic experiences are at best wishful thinking and do not conform to scientific understanding. War, conflict, poverty is an inevitable occurrence given the separate nature of humanity by nation, religion, belief, race, colour, and gender. Creation and all known life is an evolutionary product of chance. Life has no ultimate purpose beyond the physical and material needs of the body. My life started at the moment of conception and will end with my last breath. God cannot be proven by science and therefore does not exist. That kind of model is what I'd suggest is the predominant view across the large section of humanity and we are all kind of privileged and uh, I would say blessed uh, not to be within that camp. We may well have been at some point but at some point along your journey of life you have realised that there is another perspective, there is another possibility. And um, just by way of illustration, I'd like to kind of illustrate what that model is. And this is where David does a little magic trick, kind of, okay? <laughs> so um, the question is, how do we make the invisible visible? How do we make the invisible visible? Throw a sheet over. Well, we're getting close, <laughs> we're getting warm. Can we all agree there's air in this room? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Well, if there still wasn't. Breathing. Yeah, absolutely, we're still <laughs> breathing. Because if there wasn't any air, we, we would soon be in the spirit world. So we can all agree there's air in this room. Can you see the air? No. No. We only know there's air in this room because we're still breathing. We can't see it. We can't touch it as such, we can't feel it, we can't really smell it unless it becomes polluted in some way, but we all know there's air in this room. So if we go back to that question, how do we make the invisible visible? Well, this is how we do it. We've now made the invisible visible. We can all agree, can't we now, you can see not necessarily the air, but we can see the envelope. We can see the boundary that this air is contained within. And we know that the air hasn't gone anywhere. It was here to begin with. It's now in this physical form. 
and if I let this balloon go, which I'll do so very carefully because we <laughs> don't want this flying around the room, if I let that go, where's the air now? Still here, isn't it? So the air was here to begin with, it came into a physical form, and it's still here now, but it's not in a physical form. Now change the word air with spirit. And that is the alternative model. Spirit was here to begin with. You were here to begin with. At some point, you became um, manifest within a physical envelope, i.e. your body. And at some point in time, you will let go of that body. So you've never left the spirit world. You are in the spirit world here and now. And you don't have to go anywhere to get to the spirit world. It's just that we're in a physical form at the present time. And that fundamentally is the alternative model. Um, and let's just quickly run through again for the benefit of those people who are watching online what that alternative model looks like. And the key point, the first point, is that matter arises from consciousness, not the other way around. So matter arises from consciousness. Consciousness exists independently of the brain. Every human being is connected in the same way that every wave on the ocean is connected. Everything is a manifestation of consciousness. My thoughts have power, potency. They colour and influence not only my body and mind, but all beyond. Communication is natural and inevitable between consciousness of the so-called dead and living. Scientific understanding will never explain NDEs and the like for as long as it is wedded to the belief that consciousness arises from matter. War, conflict and poverty is a choice made through ignorance. When the oneness of all life is understood, it will end. Creation and all known and unknown life is the product of intelligent design beyond the comprehension of the human mind. I have incarnated into this life not by chance but through choice. Choice implies intention and intention is directed to outcome. My physical body began its cycle of life from conception, but spirit is the defining intelligence behind it. I, as an eternal spiritual being, will continue to exist just as I existed before this physical life. Material science trying to explain the existence of God is like trying to measure sound with a magnifying glass. So we're all convinced, I'm sure, that we very firmly fit in that second um, model <coughs> of uh, perception. And we can see that when we um, look at life through that lens, that communication um, between uh, the so-called living and the dead is as natural as the sun rising and the tides going in and the tides going out and birds singing. It's a natural occurrence. And yet it is still, because of the dominance of that first material model, regarded as something as being supernatural. As and when the vast majority of the population on planet Earth are in the same camp as us, 
then that's when we will see huge change taking place throughout the world. You've only got to think about healthcare, you've only got to think about education, um, to imagine how they will change when we uh, can see and we can regard life through the lens as we do uh, now. So having said all that, having set this picture um, where communication between the two worlds, between our loved ones, is a natural event, not a supernatural event, we ask ourselves, why does communication take place at all? Why do we hear from our friends and loved ones in the spirit world? Well, very simply, uh, as I said, I've been demonstrating publicly for 13 years, and I'm sure Lawrence has probably been doing it a lot longer than, than me. The reason why we have communication in the first place is purely and simply for love. All communication is born out of love. I've not once ever as a medium experienced the communication from somebody who comes through and says, you're a rotten so-and-so, you still owe me five pounds, or, you know, <laughs> I really don't like you. Sure, there can be somebody who comes through who wishes to express a profound uh, regret about something they may have said or they may have done, in effect looking for forgiveness. But that asking for forgiveness is an act of love. So there's the first point. All communication is driven by and through love. The more basic reason why we have communication is exactly the same reason why you have communication now between your friends and loved ones. If you're in the habit of phoning up a friend every now and again to say, hi, how are you doing? You know, what's going on in your life? Or phoning your mum or your dad or your son or daughter or grandchildren. That natural desire to want to remain in touch doesn't end at that point of death. Five minutes after we have passed to that higher life, we are the same person that we were. And we will be that same person for quite some considerable time until we adapt and come into realisation of our true nature. So those desires to want to be able to, to reach out and to uh, communicate with our loved ones um, is a continuing expression of who we are. As above, so below. That's kind of how it works. And another way to, to kind of imagine this, you know, let's just say for argument's sake, I'm going to say that we're all going to emigrate and we're going to go to some country and everybody tells you that when you get to that country, there's no internet, there's no mobiles, you can't send postcards, you can't send letters, you can't do anything. Once you're there, you're there. It's like a one-way trip and the door closes behind you. And what happens when you get to this um, far off and distant land and you get there and you find that's not the case. That you can actually speak to your loved ones, you can send postcards, you can let them know that you're there and you're well. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to pick up the phone, aren't you? You're going to say to them, look, I've arrived. I'm safe, I'm well, everything is okay. So communication is born out of that human natural instinct to want to let our loved ones know that we're okay, that we're still thinking about them. And that is motivated purely and simply by love. So there is the kind of stimulus, there is the motivation for communication to take place. Now we know that um, for that communication to happen, not always, but usually it's through a medium. And what is a medium? Well, um, a medium um, is a regular person. 
there is nothing um, special there is nothing highly evolved or spiritualized or anything about a medium it is just another ordinary person in exactly the same way as if I asked you all now to draw if you've got some paper and pencils and if I asked you to draw a picture of a cat my picture of a cat would look like a three-year-old's because that's the extent of my artistic ability but I'm quite sure some of you here because you've got a natural flair for art you could draw a picture that actually looked like a cat in the same way um, I'm not at all musical but I bet some people here are and I could have a lifetime of music lessons and still not be able to play jingle bells um, <laughs> some of you here would pick it up in a matter of you know days weeks whatever because you have a natural affinity and natural capacity to be able to be musical or artistic and a medium just happens to have a natural tendency to be sensitive to the impressions um, from the spirit world so that's the only difference um, between a medium and any other person so we've established that communication is natural that our loved ones and our friends in the spirit world want to communicate they want to keep in touch that is born out of love we have a medium who is sensitive who is um, disposed to receiving those thought impressions from the spirit world so what we need to do then is we get the communicator the medium and the sitter if I could use that expression and all things being equal we should then have a communication if in this scenario here if I'm the medium and Lawrence was the sitter and somebody from the spirit world is wanting to communicate with Lawrence they simply um, their consciousness overlaps with my consciousness another word for that could be aura they impress their thoughts on my consciousness of what they want to say I interpret that feel that sense that and express that to the sitter and that is communication and at that most basic level that is a tick in the box assuming that Lawrence the sitter can understand who um, the communicator is what the evidence is to um, verify their identity then that is a tick in the box as it were because we've established communication and uh, Lawrence was very clear as I was right at the beginning to say that we're going to explore evidential communication and it's perhaps worth just taking a moment to make sure that we're all clear about what the difference is between evidential and maybe psychic communication so when we talk about evidential communication we are talking about that scenario that I've just kind of presented to you um, Lawrence if he's gonna play the part of the sitter I'm the medium and we've got a fictitious I'm just gonna make up some character here so I'm, I'm not linking at the present time so I'd be saying something to Lawrence like I've got this gentleman here he's round about six foot I know he would have lost the top of one of his fingers through an accident at work um, I know that this man would have had a heart attack before he passed to the world passed the spirit world um, and I know he's got a wonky right leg and there could be other bits of information so that is evidence about the identity of the communicator and hopefully there'd more be more about his personality and his attitude and maybe a sense of humor and some names and anniversaries and all being well Lawrence would say that sounds like Fred exactly to a T that's Fred so Lawrence would be happy to accept that Fred is here impressing his thoughts to me as the medium which I then give that is an evidential communication because we're giving evidence on the identity of the communicator and we are proving that life is continuous 
because how could I get that information if it wasn't coming from the discarnate character of Fred? The other form of communication is what we might call a psychic reading. And we have to kind of go back a little step here, but if we can accept that as a spiritual being, everybody and everything has um, uh, an energy field around it, an emanation, an aura is the kind of word that we would use in spiritual, um, spiritualist terms. And again, somebody who is um, sensitive um, to perceiving those impressions would be able to, and again, if I use Lawrence as an example, um, if I allow my awareness to, as it were, to overlap Lawrence's energy, his awareness field, a good psychic would be able to read the information that's there and would be able to tell Lawrence about all sorts of kind of things about his life, what he's done, his abilities, his potentials. But the key point is the information is about Lawrence, not about a third party um, person from the spirit world. So evidential communication is very much about the first kind of model that we just uh, kind of went through. So we've said that evidential communication is born out of love. It's a natural expression of wanting to, uh, to be in touch. The medium, all being well, should be able to give information that um, verifies the identity of the communicator. And as I said, we could regard that as job done. But there's actually a lot more going on within that message. Let's just say for argument's sake, in this communication, um, this fictitious communication I've just had um, with Lawrence as the medium, and I've given information from this fictitious character called Fred. Let's just say Fred had borrowed some of uh, Lawrence's tools and uh, forgot to give them back. So Fred is wanting to express his profound regret. Um, Lawrence understands that and accepts that. We could say that is the message, but the message goes on, should go on, at a much uh, deeper, more profound level. Because if, and we'll, again, let's just imagine that Lawrence has come in for the first time and he's, he's had a communication from Fred and that's his first experience of communication, his first demonstration that life is indeed eternal. One of two things could really happen. Lawrence could walk away um, with that uh, experience having forgiven Fred and carry on with his life as if nothing had ever happened. Carrying on in a material kind of mindset, believing that this life is, is finite and there will be that point called death. And that's when it all ends. But what should ideally be happening is Lawrence goes away from that experience and thinks, well, crikey, how's that just happened? Because I thought Fred was dead. So if he's not dead, how is he still alive? How has it been possible when everybody says that when you're dead, you're dead? How has it been possible for Fred to communicate with me? That, that might lead on to another question like, well... If Fred is still alive, does that mean that I will still be alive when I'm dead? There will be another question. Well, did my life, if I'm eternal, if I can't really die, did my life actually start when I was conceived? Or is it possible that I was alive in some other capacity? There could be another question. Well, if I'm eternal, what is then the purpose of this life? And we can begin to see, I hope, that 
as we ask that first question, it should prompt another question, and another question, and another question, and another question. <coughs> and those questions are a bit like peeling the onion. We begin to turn our attention away from all the kind of distractions of the busy physical materialistic life and mindset and begin to turn our attention inwards and ask those questions of ourself. Because we want to understand, we want to have a framework uh, which makes sense to us. And that process of, as it were, turning our attention inwards, of asking ourselves those questions, takes us on a, uh, a journey, if you like, of discovery, of realisation, of unfoldment. And what it's essentially doing is moving us ever closer to the true and the full realisation of who and what we are. Because I know um, that at this point in time you might not regard yourself as a spiritual being. You may not believe that you are eternal. Because when you look in the mirror you don't see an eternal spiritual being. I certainly don't. <laughs> see that I've got a bit greyer and a bit heavier and all the rest of it. But through that process of asking those questions, we begin to sort of push the boundaries back of our awareness, of our understanding. And in that process, we are inviting the spirit world and those who are drawn to us to help us in our understanding. And we cannot then help but grow. We grow individually, we grow in terms of our intellect, we grow in terms of our compassion because we begin to see the oneness of all life. We begin to see that our place within nature. We begin to see the connections that um, are there but that we don't see from that materialistic uh, mindset. So Evidential communication, uh, there's two parts of it. There is the, the, the simple part, if you like. I'm here, I love you, I'm fine, we'll be together again yeah. one day. But the subliminal um, message, the, the, the kind of seed that is sown within that simple message is an invitation. It's um, a beckoning for individuals to come into a fuller realisation, to come into an alignment with truth. That we are going through this life uh, in varying degrees, caught up in the materialistic mindset, but that's not really how it is. And in that degree to which we are able to move ourselves um, to be more fully aligned with that other mindset, then we begin to realise our capabilities, our potentials, and we come here and we more fully do what we chose to do, which was to come into this life, not by accident, but with an intention and a clear purpose. And... Each and every one of us will have our own purpose, will have our own reason for being here. And unlike other religions, there is nobody saying, um, as so I forget your name, Ted. Ted, there's nobody here saying, don't do this or you've got to do that. Spiritualism allows us to find our own way. It allows us to make our own decisions born out of our own experience and that's the option that's the choice that we really have in this life we can 
continue to skate along the surface in that materialistic kind of mindset or we can heed the message as it were and allow that to be um, like a key going into a lock that opens up a doorway into our own understanding and our own growth um, and will serve us not only on this earthly journey but in that continuing journey when that time comes as it will for each and every one of us I know we're not doing mediumship tonight as such but here's a message for everybody we're all going to die okay <laughs> no one gets out of this alive as it were we're all going to die and the sooner that we can get our head round that and the sooner that we can be okay with that then the happier it will be because that is the other the final little um, string as it were to the bow of evidential communication if it does not remove fear I would say it's failed you could have a hundred messages of the highest quality but if that message does not remove the fear of death from you, then it's not so much the message has failed, but you've failed to realise the significance of it. And that comes down to ourselves. And it's that choice that we have, that opportunity that we have to decide how we're going to live this life. So I'm going to pause there because I've been speaking for far too long. <laughs> and I know there's a question there that... Uh, You'd like to ask? Yeah, please. The messaging, how that information is um, packaged, if I could use that expression, needs to be uh, with sensitivity. It needs to be handled with, with, you know, with care. People need to be handled um, with care. But um, I think just the kind of opposite is true. People need to kind of wake up to the opportunity the fullness that this life affords because in my perception in my experience so many people are going through this life almost in a coma kind of state their awareness is so closed down is so restricted is so narrow that um, you know when that time comes to find themselves on the other side of the spirit they'll kind of wake up realizing oh my goodness that life has gone and I didn't really live it. You know, they spend most of their life fearing death and in the process don't live life. Yeah, I, I believe, you know, we've got to be as mediums, as interpreters of our own experience and, and you know, what is given from the spirit world. We, we have to be honest. Um, of course, none of us, uh, anybody who stands on this platform can give um, their picture, their impression of how it will be and what it is like. But until we find ourselves there that will be the absolute proof but in my experience as I said everything that I've experienced of the spirit world from communication and, and any other manner of experiences has been motivated and has been through love and there's nothing in that experience that suggests to me that that future experience won't be anything like you know won't be dissimilar to that I think we do have to uh, 
give that message to, in, to, to people in those circumstances who are bereaved that um, uh, their loved ones will be fine. There will be that time um, for reunion that will happen, but they have their life here and now um, to lead and to fulfill all the obligations and all the opportunities that this life affords. And when we are able to kind of make that shift in our perception away from that materialistic mindset to the second model, then we know, we, we don't hope and we don't believe, we know that that time will come when we'll be together again. So for me as a medium, and I've been in that situation, it's uh, dealing with that person in that situation with care, with sensitivity, um, and wanting to give reassurance, I guess. Um, that's what all we can do to give reassurance that their loved ones are well, are fine, uh, will want their loved ones who remain here on the earth plane to be happy, to be fulfilled in their life but to know with absolute conviction that there will be that day when they're together again. Sorry? Um, mediumship is um, a huge undertaking. It is a huge responsibility. Um, and I'm very conscious of that every time, and I'm sure any self-respecting, sincere medium is. Every time they open their mouths from the platform to say something um, that has the potential to change a person's life hopefully for the better um, not by way of reassurance and not by way of um, uh, boasting I did have an actual experience um, in a church where I gave a communication to somebody um, they became upset which is not unusual during a communication, because of the sensitivities of it. Happens to a lot of your sitters. <laughs> Sorry? Happens to a lot of your sitters. It does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <Sorry>. at, the <laughs> at the end of the service, I went home thinking that was just a regular kind of service. Um, and a few days later, I had a, an email from um, the president of the church who went on to say that that, that person... Um, had come into that uh, service that day, that day in a in a very distressed state, a very distressed state, and the communication that she received was um, sufficient to, to completely a hundred and eighty degree change her mindset and her direction. Um, so that's the kind of uh, impact that uh, mediumship evidential mediumship can have and as I said it, it's you know never something to be kind of lightly uh, entertained yeah can I chime in on please that? yeah you, you're saying there Anne, about somebody who's bereaved it may be enough to send them over the edge yeah. if you have proven that continuity of life that will remove the bereavement process that will the bereavement is I feel like I've lost somebody in and through the evidential messages, that knowledge that now I've not lost them, they are there. So then that initial pain, this is part and parcel. And love is what we operate in. Yeah. Also in healing. Every message is a healing energy. Yeah, but you, if you're saying that because of the bereavement and then accepting that the life is continual, that the bereavement is still going to drive them over, yeah. how can it, when they've accepted that life is continual? Because they wouldn't think of that step about taking themselves off if it were not driven by the grief and bereavement process. And the evidential message, don't forget, is one little slice of the pie of spiritualism. If anything, talking to the alleged dead puts more value on this life. Understanding that we are here for a purpose. We are here for something. 
it makes a greater value of this life. I mean, because if you remove that fear of death, how valuable is life? Well, I'm sorry, that's a mindset. That's a mindset. If you take away that fear of death, that means, wow, this life, I've got to live it. I'm not going to sit here worrying about... Somebody else suffers. Somebody else can be anything, can it not? So it's a bit of a narrow question. But as I say, the initial fundamental answer is you're postulating that the bereavement process will drive somebody into taking that step because they've had the evidence that life is continual. So actually, you've got two conflicting things going on there because if you have proven life goes on, what place does the bereavement then have? we work with the intelligence of spirit yeah. and that's not a cop out yeah. we say things and thinking what the hell am I saying that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. how the hell am I saying that yeah. a message to me is an invitation yeah. from the spirit world come and find out more yeah. not come and join us it's not a rally call yeah. and I, I think find it's out more. yeah I think it's probably true in the vast majority of cases that everybody who walks in that door for the first time is in some way in some uh, great need. Uh, it may have been through uh, a bereavement, there could be other things going on in that person's life and coming in through those doors could be almost like a, a, a last resort option. Yeah, um, but as I said, you know, as Lawrence was saying, the intelligence of the spirit knows what kind of needs to be said, um, and you know, hopefully, in providing the medium, is able to to relay that. Um, that should go some way to uh, say removing that sense of uh, wanting to do something, you know. Very drastic, yeah. Thank you. More questions then? I know you've got questions. You've been soaking all that up. I've been seeing heads nodding. Yeah, please. Is there anything like someone who dies by getting into a car accident? I'm saying, like a accident death. Well. I'd, I'd, I would say there are probably, well, there certainly are differing views about whether it's possible to die before your time. Um, th there is one kind of uh, extreme school of thought that says, you know, you come into this life when, uh, you know, the, the day you kind of go is known. And nothing's going to change that. That's kind of one extreme view. Um, at the other end of the scale, um, I do believe personally that we come into this life and we may have a, a broad set of um, uh, learning lessons, things that we want to experience, um, and we've got free will, we've got choices, um, and if we choose possibly in a, in a reckless way, that could endanger this physical life. And of course, we're not immune from the actions of other people who may act in a way. So, um, is it possible to go before your time? I would have to say, I can't say with absolute conviction, but I believe it is possible. Uh, one thing uh, is for, for, for certain in my mind that um, Anybody who is seen to sort of pass before their time or compared to somebody who's lived, you know, 90 odd years, uh, their experience, you know, will be not uh, d d different. Th 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 they will be uh, met at that point of when they are dying in the physical sense. Um, 
and uh, given what help and assistance is needed to come to terms with with what's happened. Um, I know, you know, there are various things I've seen and read about people being lost, as it were, in the spirit world and in need of rescuing and helping and guided. I'm sorry, but in my book, in my understanding, that's nonsense. Um, you know, the spirit world know what they're doing. There's an intelligence there. You know, when we pass, it is a natural event in exactly the same way as birth is a natural event. You know, there's nothing supernatural about it. Um, and we'll be helped and we'll be assisted to come into that realisation of, of what has happened. Yeah, okay. Can I jump in? Please, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, you will get fed up. Yeah, no, no, go for it. Um, <laughs> my understanding my way that I visualise and think about life, when you talk about going before your time, you, you understand the theory of the life plan. So we've got a goal in our life. You know, there's certain things that you're going to experience or tackle or come up against or resolve. I think of our life plan as a tree, so it's a three-dimensional model. And you can spend your whole life going up and down different branches but each end of that branch is a different time of returning to the spirit world. So it's depending on which pathway you go along. You know, and that's my way. I, I can visualize, and I like simple things, but I can visualize that because, all right, I smoke. We know smoking is not conducive to a long and healthy life. I can stop smoking tomorrow, or I can continue smoking. That is free will. So, you know, each decision we make is putting us on different branches and different pathways, and there's nothing to say coming back down a branch and exploring another avenue. You know, we all have the epiphany moments when we've just given up on life, and then suddenly we change direction and the sun comes out again because we've just gone up another branch. So, going before your time, how do you define what your time is? You know, your, your time is part and parcel of all the decisions and lifestyle choices that you make will have an effect on that passing time. And that, again, comes back down to free will. So I'm going to give up smoking, take up jogging, <laughs> and then drop down dead with a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, please. No, I, I, d I don't believe it's that kind of detail that's that specific. Um, let's just imagine a scenario, okay? Let's just say that um, you and I are in the spirit world um, now, okay? And you are my guide and you are my mentor, okay? And I'm reflecting back on my most recent <laughs> life experience. And I say to you, um, or you remind me that one of my kind of chosen um, areas that I wanted to work on was forgiveness as an example and I may have had experiences in this lifetime where I kind of may have been close to kind of learning the lesson of forgiveness but not fully so you would say to me well look David if we look at you as a whole spiritual being, we can see that you have particular attributes in these areas. We'll call them gold stars, if you like, for lack of better expression. Um, so you've got kind of gold stars in this area, but in this particular aspect, you're still on a, a bronze or whatever, okay? This is where you need to kind of focus your attention. So as a spiritual being, I say, OK, fine, I'm happy to reincarnate into another life experience. And my main purpose in that life is to experience, to be able to have the opportunity 
to master forgiveness. So I don't believe that the specific circumstances and details as such are kind of mapped out in finite detail but I come into that life um, with that being my purpose and life will respond to that purpose so situations people there'll be opportunities in that life for me to be able to experience the need to forgive and hopefully to master that lesson. But you won't have remembered. No, not on, not on a conscious level, no. but on a, a, a deep uh, kind of spiritual level, of course it's all there, it's imprinted. And that goes back to what I was saying about the profound importance and significance of the, um, of the message of communication. Because once we've had that initial demonstration that initial proof that life is continuous that then should prompt ourselves to be asking questions and in the degree to which we ask those questions and start exploring ourselves then we become more in tune with us ourselves as a spiritual being with our purpose about realizing our potentials so um, that's a very long-winded way of saying, no, I don't believe it's kind of finite details, but we come in with a general purpose and life responds to that. Um, uh, and as Lawrence was saying, you know, we've got choices. We could go through this life and we could um, have countless opportunities to forgive and choose not to find ourselves back in the spirit world at some future date and you as my guide saying David what on, you know on earth were you thinking you had this opportunity time and time again and what did you do with it so I'd say okay well I'll go back another time we'll have another go and let's hope this time that we kind of uh, get it right and you know joking aside very light-hearted way of putting that across that's how I believe it is mm. that we have you know, we've lived thousands of lives. We've had countless lives. Because if we're eternal spiritual beings, what is eternity? Surely eternity just can't be going forward from this point in time. Eternity must mean, you know, without beginning and without end. So if we've lived countless lives beforehand and we'll have countless lives to come we'll have a constant opportunity for evolution and for growth yeah. which makes perfect sense when we look at life from our model it doesn't make any sense whatsoever if you look at all of this through a, a materialist mindset it's all mumbo jumbo you know it's flights of fancy it's wishful thinking and imagination and I understand, I get that, but I'm not looking at life and I'm not experiencing it from a materialist perspective. Is there another question? Or Sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, in a nutshell, I grew up in a spiritualist family. My grandmother was a medium all her life, and I used to go and watch my uncle do trance mediumship on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and so seeing that and being immersed in that kind of understanding was part of my childhood in exactly the same way as going to the park on a Sunday and playing football. It, it wasn't anything abnormal. So it's always been there, as it were, in my um, understanding. But it wasn't until I got to the age of 40, and literally as I turned 40, it was though someone flicked a switch in me. And I became, from being a very passive uh, 
person of understanding about life after death and spiritualism in a very general sense, it was like I became a junkie overnight and I had to find out about this, I had to experience it. And how it first started for me was, um, I, I love music, I just love listening to music and I did when I was in my 40s and I would put music on, um, <laughs> just crash out on the sea uh, and listen to music and as I used to do that I used to find um, I would start to feel funny sensations on my face it was almost like sometimes there were like cobwebs or just a, a, a peculiar feeling around my face and that's that was the first inclination and I didn't know what was going on at first I just had these sensations um, and then it started to develop and I just want to write and I'd start writing little bits of inspired writing or little bits of poetry and philosophy and I've said this before in addresses but the David you see stood before you now is nothing like David when I was 40 <laughs> uh, two completely different beings and characters almost and the David in his 40s was not somebody who wrote poetry and philosophy and all that kind of stuff so that was really kind of weird for me to have this impulse to write stuff and what was being expressed through me was of a spiritual kind of nature now uh, my mum being a spiritualist lifelong spiritualist um, she spoke to uh, an established medium and said you know son's experiencing all these things you know what's going on and he said uh, it's just a spirit they're just wanting to get his attention uh, so that was the start for me and I can tell you with hand on heart I had no desire no interest no ambition did not want to be a medium um, and the simple reason why I did not want to be a medium because back in my 40s I had an absolutely crippling fear of public speaking the idea of being a medium would be my picture of living hell <laughs> to be stood up in front of 30 or 40 people relying on an invisible power that you can't see and can't touch um, and communicating with individuals so there was no way on earth that despite being brought up as a spiritualist despite having that understanding despite those impressions that I was going to get myself up here and be a medium it wasn't going to happen my interest was very much around uh, healing uh, because you can just be very passive and you don't have to stand up in front of people um, and trance and that it fascinated me because I suppose having seen my uncle and experienced that as a child there was this deep fascination there with me and it was through that process from my 40s onwards uh, of learning of discovery of experimentation of going to circles of going to workshops and all that kind of thing and i was doing that for the best part of 10 years before i got up on a platform uh, so that was my kind of apprenticeship and i trained as a healer to begin with and as i look back i can see the spirit world uh, very carefully uh, but very cleverly led me on a little pathway that got me out of my comfort zone uh, and led me to this place where I'm stood here now uh, talking to you and through a process of uh, desensitizing allowed me to, to be able to stand here today and talk to you um, but the experiences from those early days uh, had such a profound impact on me and an effect that I could not dismiss them I could not come up with any alternative explanation and uh, forgive me I've said this before and I'll just mention it quickly because I know you won't have heard this on one of those times when I had this impulse to write I wrote in German a language that I don't know never studied and the words that were written the spelling wasn't perfect but what I'd written in German a language I don't know was step with me through the looking glass and when you have an experience like that, um, that grabs you. You can't write that off. You can't dismiss that. You can't find 
an alternative explanation other than there is an intelligence here that is communicating me and is extending an invitation. So what did I do? <laughs> you can't turn down that kind of invitation. But for me, it's been a, a progressive uh, journey of discovering and of realising. And as I said, to begin with, with not resistance, but as I said, I never wanted to be here. So I've had to be convinced, um, but the experiences have convinced me. And writing in German was just one of many that um, I've been privileged to have and have left me in no doubt whatsoever about the reality of the spirit world, of the intelligence, um, uh, and everything to do with it. No. But, but no, it's quite interesting that it sort of all is developed Absolutely. over a period of 10 years. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's through education and learning and probably understanding that it's maybe already there, yeah. but you just didn't know it. Perhaps. Yeah. I do believe that we come into this, because I've often asked myself, you know, why in my 20s didn't I start exploring this? Why didn't I do it then? And I don't think I was meant to. I don't think I was... Uh, intellectually or, or whichever you want to describe it capable of dealing with it and, and I, perhaps I wasn't meant to and you know lots of people I see they kind of come into this at the right time uh, you know I've got uh, uh, nieces who are in their teens and they're desperately interested and keen about this but I'm kind of almost pushing them away a little bit uh, I'm not saying they don't do it but they're interested, but you know, we have a duty, we have a responsibility to this life first and foremost. You know, we've got to experience life, and in my estimation, those mediums who are long-standing and, in, in my kind of uh, view and estimation, have the credibility of those people who um, have been through life have life experiences because how can you talk to somebody about bereavement if you haven't experienced bereavement yourself how can you relate how can you have empathy with an experience that you haven't had um, so life experience I believe is important as a medium um, and uh, maybe if I'd you know pursued mediumship in my 20s it would have been because I wanted to rather than the spirit saying now it's time interesting there <clears throat> David had that experience not brought to him via a medium that was his own awareness his own communication personal to him direct from spirit within spiritualism we are seeing uh, the last 20-30 years the emphasis has become the evidential message and thereby raising the status of evidential mediums as being the stars of the show and then the drive therein of saying well I want to be like you know because people say to me oh I'd love to be a platform medium and think right well there's 52 Sundays in the year you can kiss <laughs> goodbye to 48 of them yeah. <laughs> how does that grab you how, how, how does that feel you know um, but we have been and when I say we, I'm talking about the movement and everybody within it. Um, been promoting the evidential medium as being the sort of like pinnacle and creating this illusion. You know, when we see uh, all the workshops, all the courses designed to improve your evidential mediumship, a couple of the last awareness night, we were talking about circles, and I've done some rough figures on population of mediums the general population and it's like one person in a hundred thousand people would actually progress to become a platform evidential medium but what spirit want what spirit are pushing us to do is just to increase our own awareness so we can experience moments like david had for ourselves because I tell you, 
I've had messages, I've had readings, etc, etc, etc. But the most powerful, the most poignant and the most meaningful communications were the ones that I have had myself. You know, I can never, you know, they're there. Just think about them, they're there, they're so strong. So, you know, with the evidential message, yes, we can demonstrate what we talk about, but the greater, or one of the greater uh, messages from the spirit world is be your own medium. Mm -hmm. And we don't mean a medium as in needing somebody else's validation, because we do tend to chase that a lot. We're lucky as evidential mediums, we get immediate validation. We get a yes or a no. Our healing mediums don't get that because they will continue to just give healing, give healing, give healing, you know, and they're not getting that instant validation thing. And we do spend a lot of time looking for that validation. But as I say, trust me, if you expand your awareness enough to, and what David um, was just relaying, is there for everybody. I'm not going to say we're all going to get a message in German, but that depth of communication, just knowing that somebody is there, and it's, you know what, that's what the spirit world wants. When we talk Absolutely, about making yeah. it, you know, making us our own mediums, it's not to stand up here and get a round of applause or rotten tomatoes or the validation. It's just, you know what, I said, if people take record of me, I can even from St. Anne's, I think, <laughs> sometimes. Because I can sit there, and I'm in hysterics sometimes. I don't mean badly, I'm just hysterical laughter. Because a thought will go up, and some, some of my lot will say something, and I go, oh my God. <laughs> but it's real. It is so real. granddaughter she's lived in France now they're in a big old French house and the first time I went to see them after my son died they were here she actually saw my son and I know she did because of the way she was reacting she was battered instead of crying like this mm -hmm. you know. and she was so pleased and happy that she'd seen uncle told me not to worry yeah. that he was okay and he was smiling and he was doing pretty well right? um, but now evidently I hear she's upset because she hasn't seen him since yeah. and I think is it Steve not wanting to come forward and show himself or I don't understand why she hasn't been able to see him anything yeah. and I need to Uh -huh. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, um, I don't know. Yeah, I know what I say to her, but whether it's so with the hearing and the second off kind of thing, yeah. I don't know if they'd be that happy because I can't just dismiss what she's seen. No, no. And I don't want to. I'd like to to notice. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I recognize the difficulty with with grandchildren i've got a grandson myself and you know there are boundaries that we have to kind of obviously respect uh in terms of what we say and what our views that we kind of might uh import but leaving that to one side and i guess only you can decide you know how you kind of manage that part of it but in terms of how do we support uh, a child in that um, situation uh, I think we just have to be as natural and as open and as matter of, of fact mm -hmm. and that's certainly how I've been um, with uh, my grandson I mean I joke with him that he's my little Jedi apprentice you know <laughs> he says he calls me gang gang and he says gang gang he said he said you're the Jedi master and I said yes and you're my Jedi apprentice 
Um, but uh, we kind of joke about it. But uh, even at the age of four, you know, we've had kind of conversations in that very matter of fact way. What we have to kind of recognise that almost inevitably as the children grow up, because of the influence of parents and school and all those other outside influences, that natural sensitivity will more than likely kind of contract. Um, not always, there are some children who, you know, retain that. And um, uh, I can quote Eileen Davies, fantastic medium as an example. She was seeing and experiencing um, spirit all throughout her childhood and has been a medium all her life. She's never had a, a conventional job, she's been a medium. Um, so there are instances and cases where children retain that sensitivity, that perceptive ability throughout their life. But by and large, most children, you know, it's like the Peter Pan effect, isn't it? By the time they get to kind of seven, they seem to have lost that connection, that, that perception. It may well be that was a one-off experience but I would be saying something to the child along the lines of um, you know uh, sorry was it Steve did you say yeah yeah that um, you know he, he's still well uh, we'll be busy you know experiencing this and doing that and doing you know whatever but he's still present mm -hmm. and uh, you know to, to put to, yeah to put that suggestion there to them, that we've only got to think about them yeah. and um, expect to be able to feel. You may not always see them, but they'll find some way to um, communicate their presence. Um, I'm, I'm fine. Um, I'm allergic to the temperature. So sure. I'm fine. I haven't got to go anywhere. <laughs> Um, I can relate my own direct personal experience which will throw light on this when my um, father passed um, one of the early communications we had again from a very uh, trusted and respected medium actually said that my dad had chosen to remain as it were when I say close to the earth I don't mean physically but had chosen to remain to be able to maintain kind of contact, close contact. And the implication of, was, of that was that, um, you know, he would have naturally had opportunities to progress and to go on further. And my understanding, and it is just an understanding, that um, when we find ourselves in the, in the spirit uh, realms, there is a, a, a natural progression you know, whether you want to call it levels or planes or vibrations, but there is a natural. And my understanding is that as we progress further, um, it becomes not so easy to be able to express and to communicate back through on the earth plane. Um, certainly there are uh, other relatives of mine who I was very close to and who I would naturally would have expected to hear from and haven't. And my understanding is that, you know, they're kind of, um, it's not that they don't love me anymore, they don't care for me, but they're kind of so caught up with <laughs> all the opportunities um, and the experiences in that life. And it's not that they've forgotten us, I'm sure they are still around, but maybe are able to express in ways that we're just not picking up on. Yeah. Go through Estelle Roberts' book about her, written by her guide Red Cloud. 
he actually describes it took seven of our earth years for him to lower his vibration to be able to communicate with Estelle Roberts to act as her guide. So, yeah, so he's actually, you know, stating that that it's taken seven years to be able to converse because it's come back for that purpose as being Red Cloud and the guide and the books that are spawned therein. It just goes to show a case of that is the case. Where he was at the beginning of that seven years, communication wasn't possible. <coughs> I guess the other, and I'm not saying this is the explanation, but if I think about, bring it into a sort of personal uh, uh, example, when I find myself in the spirit world, um, you know, my dad's there, mum's still here at the moment, but all my kind of um, aunts and uncles and people that I kind of grew up with as a child are all in spirit. The only people kind of left behind at this point are my children and grandchildren. And not wishing my children into the spirit world, but at, at some point um, it will be uh, me and the children in the spirit world, and the only ones left behind will be the grandchildren, and that's or great grandchildren. And that's not to say that my love and my care and my interest has diminished for them. But there's almost a, a greater bond, almost a greater pull for those who are in the spirit. Um, so that may yeah, be, yeah, be part and parcel of that. Yeah, yeah. but that, that's just my personal theory. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Do we have a final question? Any more for any more? Yes, Jay, you've been very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share with you just one final little um, yeah, anecdote, if yeah. that's all right. We've been speaking about children, and we've been speaking about um, contact, and uh, the fact that the spirit world, when we give them an opportunity, will want to demonstrate that they are around. And I spoke about my grandson, Rafe. He's now four, but when he was two and a half, I was looking after him um, one day. And you're not two and a half year olds like, they can get a bit kind of uh, stroppy, can't they? Um, and uh, he was sat down with me and uh, in kind of desperate measures I whipped out my phone and started scrolling through and was showing him some of the pictures of him when he was a baby and there's some videos there and it was kind of distracting him and what I'd forgotten was that my brother had sent me through a batch of photographs of my dad taken from about 40 years ago um, and um, I was scrolling through and uh, this picture popped up of my dad from 40 years ago. Now we've only got one photograph in our house of my dad, you know, a, 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 a kind of a nice one. And it's up on a shelf and it's out of the eyesight of Rafe, the grandson. And I don't often talk, I haven't talked directly to my grandson about my dad. He wouldn't have understood things at two and a half. Um, so anyway, I was flicking through, this picture came up of my dad, and without thinking, I pointed at the picture and I said to Rafe, at two and a half years age, of age, who's that? And he said, Frank. And that was my dad's name. There wasn't a moment's hesitation but at that, came out with Frank. Now, you could put any number of possible explanations to that. My belief is that um, he knew who that was, because he knew my dad before Rafe came into this existence. He remembered him. Um, mm. And it makes perfect sense to me. It makes perfect sense when we view this life in the second model, in that spiritual kind of perspective. Why wouldn't he know my dad? The other alternative explanation was in that moment, my dad was present, not that I was aware that he was present, and influenced and inspired my grandson to come out with his name. And if that is the case, if Lawrence, if you want to book the young Ray, oh, okay. yeah. he's quite cheap at the moment. <laughs> his expenses are a, are a box of Jaffa cakes, and he'd be quite happy with that. <laughs> oh, we don't share Jaffa cakes. <laughs> yeah. so David, open oh, the door for spirit, yeah. and they will step in. Okay, thank you.
Brilliant. David. Yes, thank, you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Deserved a church call tonight. That was great. Handouts, props. I mean, <laughs> what more do you want? Come on. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank yeah. you for taking this evening. Our next awareness night, the beginning of April, will be taken by Jamie Williamson, and the topic will be philosophy. And then in May, we have a return visit from the man himself tonight to talk about healing. So these awareness nights will just slowly build up different aspects of spiritualism. But I hope you've enjoyed tonight. Fascinating talk, presentation, 101%, absolutely bang on. Thank you, David. Brilliant. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for those watching us live tonight and those who may watch in the future. We hope this is just going to help you understand and just grow. Lady there said a very key word, and thank you for saying that, education. Education. Yeah, we've got to engage with this movement, this philosophy of and religion of spiritualism. We'll never be passive in our mediumship. We've always we've got to be active. Why? 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 Keep going, Matt. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.